Good evening, everyone. Well, it's really a pleasure to see all of you here back in person and, uh, and, and, uh, and live even with a, a cocktail session afterwards. We're super excited uh, to be back in person for SED Talks uh, this year. So my name is Jeff Thorson. I'm the Associate Director of TIZED, uh, Trachi Institute for Sustainability in Engineering and Design. I'm also a Professor in Mechanical Engineering and I lead the Alternative Fuels Laboratory. Uh, along with Professor Subhashis Goshal, the director of TIZ, um, I'd like to welcome everyone to our fifth uh, annual SED Talks event. We're pleased to announce this year SED Talks is sponsored by WSP, uh, world, one of the world's leading professional service firms. In a few minutes, we're going to have the chance to hear from Mr. Eric Pysel, um, the, the, the global director of transport and infrastructure at WSP, about their commitment to sustainability and their decision to support this initiative. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge um, that McGill University is located on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous peoples. We acknowledge and thank the diverse Indigenous peoples whose presence marks this territory on which people of the world now gather. For those of you who don't know much about the SED Talks program, we start in the fall uh, with a series of training workshops that are open to students across the Faculty of Engineering, the various departments and schools, um, and, uh, and they um, they take part in workshops that are aimed at explaining your research to a general audience, creating a story, um, and, uh, and increasing the accessibility towards this. Um, and the goal is to, uh, to improve overall communication skills, of course, but also to celebrate the research that's going on at McGill um, and the excellent research going on by all of our graduate students. Then at the conclusion of those workshops, we hold an event called SEDX 180S, which is basically an, a three minute thesis competition where students explain their research um, in three minutes uh, from uh, the various students who took part in the workshops. And, uh, and we then have a uh, committee, selection committee, uh, that selects three change makers who take part in the wor winter workshop uh, program where we work closely with those three change makers to prepare their talks that you're going to see here tonight. Um, and so I hope you will agree that their efforts have paid off. So at this point, I'd like to welcome um, Mr. Eric Pizel, Global Director for Transport and Infrastructure at WSP, and a McGill alumnus uh, to, uh, to give us, uh, to say a few welcoming words. Eric. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, great to be here in person. In fact, uh, last year for the last uh, SED Talks, it was kind of my first in-person event since uh, COVID. So it's great a year later that the world has finally really started to open up and we're getting back to normal here. Uh, as I said last year, it was just great to see the three different change makers that we had. Uh, as I said, really inspirational. And when I took a look at the, uh, the three change makers we have, again, a great diversity of different uh, subjects that we're going to be talking that all link back to sustainability. Um, you know, I'm, uh, as mentioned, I'm a, I'm a proud uh, uh, alumnus here at McGill uh, from the Faculty of Engineering, actually the School of Urban Planning. Uh, and so, uh, in fact, uh, at the time, uh, you know, we didn't really, we talked about sustainability, but not in the way we do today. And, you know, my background is I'm a tr transportation planner, kind of specialist in transit. So I've always uh, been into sustainable modes without knowing it was cool at the time. And it's great to see that over the years, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the emphasis across uh, that and sustainability has just increased. Um, you know, just to talk a little about uh, WSP, the company I work for, so it's a, a, a global engineering and uh, environmental consultancy and design firm that's headquartered right here in Montreal. So we have about 67,000 people around the world. Uh, so, you know, we are the, uh, the largest uh, firm uh, in, in our space. Um, and in fact, over the last years, we've really been doing a, a lot of work in terms of what are the main pillars we, we want to exercise in, and one that we've been growing quite rapidly over the last years to actually become the largest environmental consultancy in the world is our environmental practice. Uh, and so we've grown that tremendously over the last years. Um, and you know, when I started off, environmental services were really more of a support to our other, our other projects, and be it in infrastructure, transportation, buildings, et cetera, et cetera. But now, as we're pivoting towards this, this, new, uh, this new world order around sustainability, we're seeing that uh, you know, our clients need more and more help to take a look at sustainability, their gr broader ESG goals, their decarbonization. Uh, and often, uh, as, as many of you know, people make great 
big announcements that they're going to do X, Y, and Z, uh, you know, achieving net zero or whatever else. Uh, but the reality is often when they've made those announcements, uh, they haven't quite figured out the roadmap. So we actually spend a lot of time with clients across the spectrum uh, to really help them on that roadmap and help them develop their, their plans. Uh, and as such, you know, our, our company is also very committed to, uh, to reducing our environmental footprint and increasing our ESG. Uh, in fact, you can go online. Uh, we have our annual ESG report that's published every year. Our new one is actually going to be coming out in May. Um, you know, the highlights from last year's report, uh, you know, we were able to reduce just last year 15% uh, of our greenhouse gas emissions to uh, scope one through three as an organization. But of course for us, you know, at the end of the day we produce mostly, I like to say paper, because at the end of the day we're consultants. So one of the things we're working more and more on is actually trying to work with our clients to reduce the amount of carbon in our designs by 50%. Um, and, uh, you know, that's really taking our, our clients and changing the way that they look at their projects. So, uh, you know, I, I get the opportunity to talk to our clients around the world um, and so it's amazing to see even over the last year, uh, you know, this time last year, the Australian government was still denying climate change. Uh, and, you know, I was down there in November after the change in government and you, very rapid change in embracing how do we decarbonize our economy, how do we decarbonize our infrastructure, uh, and great discussions that I had with, with key decision makers throughout the country. Um, and you know, if we take a look at Europe, they're, they're definitely ahead of where we are today. Um, but uh, you know, there is really an understanding of this journey uh, around decarbonization, but also bigger themes around sustainability and uh, you know, the, the, the UN SDG goals that are out there in terms of sustainability. Uh, and in fact, one of the things our company does is we kind of map our revenue. And so close to 60% of our revenue uh, for uh, 2022 uh, actually was supporting projects that support UN SDG goals. So a, uh, a majority of our work really is in that space and we're looking to, 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 to continue to grow that uh, until practically all of our work is really uh, s supporting uh, UN SDG goals. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really great to see how this pivot's coming in. And the interesting thing is it's a bit of the Wild West out there. You know, we're very cognizant that uh, a lot of people are greenwashing currently and, and pushing their, their SDG goals. So, uh, you know, our company has really taken on scientific targets. And what we do is we work with our clients to make sure that they're taking on scientific-based targets, helping them on that journey, uh, which is why it's just great to listen to our change makers today about how they're going to help propel us even more in the future, because the reality is, even if you take every technology we have, uh, we still don't have that journey to net zero understood. You know, I can talk uh, as the lead for transportation and infrastructure, you know, what we use every day in our projects is concrete, steel, and asphalt. If you look, they're the top three industrial pollutants in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, concrete is the second most used substance on the planet. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of work being done around how we decarbonize, but no one quite knows how that looks yet. Uh, in terms of a lot of those. So, you know, it's an exciting place for all of you uh, and for our change makers because the book hasn't been written and how we get there. Uh, we're starting the journey. Uh, we know where the end point has to be, but we just don't know how we're going to get there yet. So with that, I'm looking forward to listening to our three change makers this evening. And as I said, we're really excited at WSP to be uh, supporting this uh, because for us, it's, it's key to our mission and key to what we do as a firm. So thank you very much. And I'll turn it over to the team. Thank you very much, Eric. So uh, for, for now, just a few words about uh, tonight's event. We're going to have three speakers. Each is going to talk for about 15 minutes. Um, in order to not disrupt the flow, we're going to ask that you uh, hold your questions to the end, and then we're going to have a general Q&A session at the end of the event. Um, also, if you do need to leave for any reason during the event, we ask you to uh, please wait till the transition between the speakers, and that's a good time um, to, uh, to, to leave. So for now, I'll ask Fatima to please come up. So our first change maker of the evening is uh, Fatima Afsal, a PhD student in the Department of uh, Civil Engineering, co-supervised by Professor Dominic Frigon um, and Professor Stan Kubo from the School of Human Nutrition. And tonight, Fatima is going to tell us about how our choices of what we eat for breakfast can change the fate of superbugs. Fatima.
The entire world has just faced COVID-19, whose fatality rates were over 2 million deaths per year. It was a surprise pandemic, and no, we were not prepared for it. But the next health crisis is not going to be a surprise. In fact, it is going to be due to antimicrobial resistance, and predictions already say that its fatality rates could be as much as 50 million deaths per year from 2050. 2050 is not that far. In fact, all of us are planning to be here in 2050. And some of you might even be here in this room, probably attending the 30th edition of Set Talks. People in research and academia are taking efforts to curb the threats brought by antimicrobial resistance. And we all might have a role to play here as well. The threat due to antimicrobial resistance has been increasing because of the increase in the number of hotspots which kinds of act as a storehouse for these pathogens. Two years back, Claire was on this stage and through her you learned about wastewater treatment plants being a hotspot for, wastewater for antimicrobial resistance genes. She's my colleague, we work in the same lab in fact. Before her, we already knew about the possibility of hospitals and animal farms being the hotspot for antimicrobial resistance. And through her, we learned about a third hotspot, the wastewater treatment plants. And today, I am here on the same stage to introduce you all to a fourth hotspot for antimicrobial resistance. Think about it. Where could it be? If it's not animal farms and hospitals and wastewater treatment plants, where else could it be? How does it look like? Well, well, let's come back. The answer is right here in this room. Surprised? It could be me. Or it could be you, you or you. It could be any of you sitting here right in this room acting as a hotspot for antimicrobial resistance. How did this happen? Let me show you. The treated wastewaters, still containing the microbes which are carrying the antimicrobial resistance genes, are being released into the waters we swim, used for irrigating the farms where we grow our foods, or may even leak into the ground waters or surface waters which we depend for drinking. That sounds scarier now, doesn't it? But the story does not stop here. Now imagine a non-pathogen carrying an antimicrobial resistance gene entering our gut. In our gut, they are encountering our gut microbes, which play critical roles in keeping us healthy. Now these resistance genes can be considered as batons that we use in relay races. These non-pathogens can transfer the antimicrobial resistance gene batons to the gut microbe, thereby creating a hotspot for these resistance genes in our gut. Now fast forward to another day when a pathogen enters the body. This pathogen does not carry a resistance gene yet. But our gut microbe, now carrying the resistance gene baton, can transfer these to the pathogen, thereby creating a superbug right there. Let me say that again. Our gut microbe just turned a normal pathogen into an antimicrobial resistant superbug. We could pass on these, super, these resistance genes to our loved ones, or one can come to an event like this and pass it on to another person for whom it might become a problem. So what we have learned since Claire was on this stage two years back is that it's not just animal farms and hospitals and wastewater treatment plants. But all of us sitting here in this room right now may be acting as a fourth hotspot for antimicrobial resistance. That is the bad news. But the really good news is that since we know it is happening, we can do something about it. And that is what I'm going to share with you all tonight. First of all, to be able to study our gut microbiota, we need to have a system which will allow us to continuously monitor the gut microbiota and it should be versatile as well. Because our entire gut is not a single reactor. It has got various compartments ranging from the stomach to the small intestine and the large intestine. Out of these, the large intestine has got higher number of microbes as high as about one kilogram. Hence, I would be focusing on large intestine for my studies. But the complexity does not stop here. 
The food that comes into the large intestine needs to be first processed by the enzymes that are released by the stomach and the small intestine. In addition, the large intestine has got three compartments, namely the ascending, transverse and the descending colon because of the slightly different pH values which are present in them. Hence the system that we come up with need to be able to address all of these complexities and that is what I have done in my lab. Over the past year, I have built in the lab an artificial human digestive system whose model has been adapted from our collaborators who work in School of Human Nutrition here at McGill. And we have tried to give it a very creative name, the gut emulator, consisting of different compartments ranging from the stomach to the small intestine and the large intestine, three of the compartments as you can see here. Each of this compartment would be fed three times a day, similar to how we have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Moreover, in all of in the first two reactor compartments, representing the stomach and the small intestine, we would be adding in enzymes. And the last three compartments, which represent the large intestine, would be inoculated with human fecal samples to represent the gut microbiota that would be developing inside them. Such a system would allow us to study sustainably the gut microbiota and hence I will be utilizing the gut emulator reactor to study how these resistance gene patterns are being transferred between each of the compartments. Another important factor of the gut model is that each of the reactor component has got a different pH value. Now how is the pH important? The pH of each compartment will ultimately determine the kind of microbial community which will develop in them. Hence it is important to be able to continuously monitor the pH of each of the compartment which is being done in a reactor with the Raspberry Relay Circuit System which will monitor the pH every 10 seconds and would add in acid or base accordingly to bring back the pH to its normal range as it was specified for each of the reactor. We have already carried out the trial run for our gut emulator reactor and the results for the pH that has been obtained for the ascending colon, which is the first compartment of the large intestine, has been represented here. And as you can see, the x-axis represents the number of days of operation of the reactor. The most important thing to note here is that over the course of the operation for most of the time, the pH value is staying within the range that was specified for the reactor, which is around 5.7 to 6.1 here. But you might also be noticing certain peaks and dips that are occurring here, which are majorly occurring when the food is coming to the reactor or leaving out of the reactor. Because remember, the food is coming from a reactor whose pH value is different. And also, it will create a change in volume within the reactor. So ultimately, the pH would be different. But the most important takeaway here is that our pH regulatory system has been effective in making sure that the pH is staying within the range that has been specified in the beginning. So now we know that the gut emulator works. Now what next? I would be utilizing the gut emulator to study the resistance gene baton transfer process, which can be divided into two steps. The first step involves a study of entry of resistance genes containing microbes from wastewater, followed by a study of what exactly happens within the gut following their entry. For the first part, I would be adding microbes which are derived from the wastewater into the gut emulator. And the samples that are obtained at several time points would be analyzed to see how the microbial community is evolving in each of the compartments and whether it is changing with respect to the invasion that is happening from the outside. We would also be utilizing a specialized multiplex PCR system which we have developed in our lab, which would be able to tell us if the levels of the resistance genes are changing when the invasion is occurring. Now for the second part, I would be utilizing a group of specialized microbes which show fluorescence. Now, they are showing fluorescence because they carry a specific gene, the green fluorescence gene. So the green fluorescence protein encoding gene can be considered as the baton here. If this baton is being transferred to our gut microbiota, our gut microbes will begin to show fluorescence, which can be detected by using specialized microscopy systems. Thus, 
both these studies would be able to help us understand how these resistance genes enter our gut and what happens inside it, whether it is different between each compartments and with respect to time, how it changes. So now we have looked at the problem and the, uh, now we have looked at the problem. How about the solution? What if the solution could be in changing the gut microbiota composition? What if we can have a solution in which it can on one hand increase the number of beneficial microbes in the gut, but at the same time can bring down or inhibit the growth of the pathogens and superbugs? Can we achieve both at the same time? Is there such a solution? Looks like we know such a molecule. It is called anthocyanins, belonging to the class of polyphenolic compounds which are abundantly present in plants. Research already shows that polyphenols, especially anthocyanin, has got the ability to improve the growth of beneficial microbes in our gut, but at the same time inhibit the growth of pathogens and superbug. It is also possible that they might be playing a role in the baton transfer process itself or affecting the levels of resistance genes following the invasion. We do not know yet, and that is what I'm trying to do using my gut emulator reactor. So I would be employing anthocyanins along with the feed that is given to the gut emulator reactor to test their effects during the invasion of the resistant stains into the gut and the baton transfer process that might be occurring in the gut following their entry. Now you may ask me, if anthocyanins are that important, Fatima, where can I find them? Well, you might already be having them in your breakfast oatmeals or muffins. Yes, we are looking at blueberries, which has got one of the highest content of anthocyanin, as high as 60 to 80 percent of its weight. Hence, I will be utilizing the anthocyanins, which are derived from blueberries, in my gut emulator reactor to test their effects in helping us reducing the impacts brought by the resistance gene invasion and the baton transfer process ultimately. So far, as you have seen, most often the solutions to some of our biggest problems may be lying in smallest compounds, such as blueberry anthocyanins. And we have also seen that. Antimicrobial resistance is not someone else's problem to deal with because we all are acting as superbug generating machines right now. So a possible solution to improve the health at an individual level for a sustainable and healthy future might be to add in that extra box of blueberries the next time that you go for grocery shopping. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fatima. Come on up, Amir Reza. Come on up. So our second speaker tonight is uh, Hamad Reza Ermagan, a PhD student in the Department of Mining and Materials Engineering, working under the supervision of Professor August Sosmito, and is co-supervised by Professor Leila Amiri from the Department of Mechanical Engineering at University of Sherbrooke. Tonight, Hamad Reza is going to talk to us about an old method of energy storage that can move us towards a greener future. Hamad Reza. <clears throat> Renewables are not always available when needed, and they're not always needed when available. So, what's, uh, so here's the thing that we should uh, work on. We need to find a way to address this mismatch between energy supply and demand, and for that, we can store energy when we have access to it to later on use it when we don't. But the current energy storage trend is not sustainable as it mainly relies on lithium ion batteries and we are already facing a shortage in critical minerals. Well, although many ongoing research is being done to improve battery sustainability as well as efficiency, but as of now, most batteries are not sustainable and I'll tell you why. Well, batteries are relatively expensive because of two main reasons. First, the raw materials that are used in them are expensive because they are highly in demand in various industries. Second, if we want to use these materials inside these batteries, we need them in their purest form, which means additional processing, which translates to additional cost. Most batteries are also not environmentally friendly, and there are, again, two reasons for that. First, the whole mining and processing of these materials can harm our environment. Second, 
the, uh, second, the fact that we need to uh, make these batteries, uh, it is it, uh, like when we, when we are done with these batteries and we want, when we want to dispose them, these the toxic chemicals that are inside them can contaminate our water supplies as well as soil and our whole ecosystem. Speaking about our lifespan, they are also not that long lasting. And you don't need me to tell you why. You have your smartphone batteries to do the talking. What if I told you there is an alternative sustainable for that, which is much cheaper, around one-tenth in price, which is, more, more, which is much more environmentally friendly, and which is, uh, and which is basically much uh, durable, around three times longer. Well, to, to give you a clue about that, let us travel back in time to see how our ancestors used to store energy. Well, back then, people would cook completely different than the way we do today. So what they would do was to dig a hole and fill it with stones. Then these stones would absorb the heat of the sun during daytime, and this heat was gradually released overnight to cook people's food. Fast forward to around 500 years ago, which was supposedly a very cold time in our history, there was this building that would offer the residents and extremely warm all day long. Well, in this building, what was done, that tall windows were placed that would allow the sunlight to be absorbed by a huge spine wall. This spine wall would then gradually release the heat overnight to keep all the residents warm. Well, you might have, as you might have already guessed it, we are going to store energy inside rocks. Well, rocks do exceptionally well at withstanding really high temperatures. And that is really important for us, because we are not only interested in storing heat as heat. We want to transform it to electricity. And for that, we need to be working with really high temperatures. Also, storing energy inside rocks can not only be used for short-term applications, like daily storages, but they can also be used for longer-term applications, say, for seasonal storage. Well. Let us take a look at how our thermal energy storage system, which is based on rock, works. Well, the whole concept of storing energy inside rocks is pretty straightforward. All we have to do is to send hot air through the initially cold packed bed of rocks. By doing so, we are increasing the temperature of the rocks as well as the energy contained within the systems. So then, when our system is fully charged, we reach the point of standby, in which we can store energy for as much as we want, provided that this system is well insulated. And uh, this gives us the energy storage that we want. Later on, whenever we want to use it, all we have to do is to send cool air to extract the heat from these now hot rocks. As you can see, the energy within the rocks would decrease, and all this energy would be transferred to our air. And this hot air can be later uh, be put in really good use, that we'll get into shortly. Well, now that we are familiar with how this system works, let us see how sustainable they are. Well, the sustainability of our whole system really comes down to how this air is heated and how it is delivered to the system. And for that, what we plan to do is to use renewables. So basically what we'll do is to use the clean electricity produced from, from solar panels or wind turbine to run an electric heater. Then this electric heater would hit the air and would be sent to our packed bed of rocks. And how this heat would be stored later in the discharging cycle is to just be used to run a gas turbine in which the hot gas, which is now full of energy, can rotate the blades of a gas turbine to create electricity for us. Well, this is an overview of the proposed system and how the packed bed of rock can act as our missing link for energy storage. Well, as you can see, there are many components in our system. We have the renewables component, we have our fan and electric heater, of course, we have, we have our packed bed of rock, which acts as the energy storage, and then we have our electricity generation component. So, 
in, so in my initial phase of the research, what we're interested in is to see how this packed bed of rock works. So for that, we can do experimental uh, setup. So I, I, that's actually what we have already done. With the help of our colleagues at University of Sherbrooke, we have an experimental setup to see how the heat exchange between the air, ex air and rocks are happening. As you can see, this is our packed bed of rocks. We have a heat gun to provide hot air for us. The system is insulated so that we can create the storage that we want. And also, there are thermocouples located at different axial points to measure the temperature for us. However, we are losing out on, an, on, a, on a powerful tools, which are numerical simulations. So I'll tell you why they are so beneficial for us. Well, first of all, we are dealing with really high temperatures. And it's much safer to do the testing with numerical methods compared to the experimentals. A and also, we have this opportunity to test different storage materials. This numerical simulation can give us a cost-effective method to test, different test, uh, to test different storage materials as well as heat transfer fluids. So for instance, what is the right type of rock to be used in our storage system? Is it limestone or is it sandstone? Or should we use magnetite? And also, why are we even sending air? Why not thermal oils or uh, molten salt? So there are many options for us that numerical methods will provide a cost-effective method to, to predict them. Now that we know how powerful numerical methods are, let us consider two common approaches to predict uh, the temperature in, in this packed bed of rocks. So we can either use macro scale or micro scale simulation. So in macro scale simulation, we consider the whole packed bed of rock and only include the overall effect of these uh, rocks. We do not take, indiv take them individually. And this is the result that we get. As you can see, as the air is moving through this packed bed of rock, it is heating our system. And this is what we actually want. This is what we call macroscale simulation. But in microscale simulation, what we're interested is to include the effect of the presence of each and every rock. And this is the result that we get if we do the microscale simulation. Well, now that we know these two numerical methods are available at our disposal, let us compare them and see which one gives a better prediction of the overall performance of the system. So for doing that, we have compared these numerical solutions with what experimental data gives us. So for that, we have considered the charging cycle. So imagine that we are sending air at relatively high temperature, a temperature of 700 Kelvin, and we have our rock at the room temperature. So after one hour into the charging, this is the experimental result that we get. As you can see, the initial part of the pack bed is already heated up. After four hours of uh, sending the air, and after four hours into the charging cycle, this is the results that we get. As you can see, almost half of the pack bed temperature has increased. And after seven hours, almost the majority of the pack bed is heated. So this is our experimental data. Let us compare the two numerical methods that I mentioned earlier and see how they would predict the temperature profile along the packed bed of rock. Well, this is the results that we get when using macroscale simulations. As you can see, although the general trend is being predicted, but the experimental data and numerical results vary significantly. However, let us see what happens if we take the microscale approach. This is the results that we get. As you can see, the, resu the results almost perfectly agree, meaning that we have a powerful numerical simulation. With this numerical technique that is really powerful in predicting the temperature along the packed bed, we are confident in following the many objectives that we have in this research project. One of the objectives that we are following is to see, how the, to see how the rock sizes would, uh, would predict the overall performance of the system. So if we decrease the size of the particles, we would need a, a much larger fan, 
And that is because it is much more difficult to send the air through the now more packed, uh, packed bed of rocks. However, it can fasten the charging and discharging cycle and also produces more electricity for us, which are both good things. However, if we go with larger particles, intuitively, we'll need a much smaller fan, which is a good thing. However, it will prolong the charging and discharging time as well as the, the electricity that is produced, meaning that there is a trade-off for the optimal size of the rocks. And since we now have the right numerical framework, we can answer this question much more easily. Well, overall, although renewables offer a clean source of power to us, but they are of no good use if we cannot accurately predict what's happening. And what I, what I aspire to do in this research project is not only to make the, the, make the source of our energy clean, but to make the whole chain of the energy usage clean, which is not possible unless we master the art of thermal energy storage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ahmed Reza. Come on up. Great. So thank you again, Hamad Reza. So our final speaker tonight uh, is Arav Sahrawala, a Master of Science student in the Department of Chemical Engineering, uh, working under the supervision of Professor Natalie Tefenji. And Arav's gonna talk to us tonight about a novel detection method for nano and microplastics in aqueous environments. Please go ahead, Arav. It's Friday night, and you've been craving seafood all week. So you head over to your favorite restaurant and sit in front of this delicious meal. And what you think you're eating is a bite of this fish, but what you're actually also eating is this. To be a little bit more precise, it's these tiny micro and nanoplastics that could be inside your food. Now it's probably hard to see them because they're very small. That's why I've circled them for you. Since the 1960s, we've thrown out 4.89 billion tons of plastic into the environment and landfills. Once they end up there, they go through weathering conditions, such as the exposure to the sun, um, changes in temperature, as well as mechanical degradation. So that water bottle that you just threw out 10 years ago breaks down into smaller micro and nanoplastics. Now, these nanoplastics are extremely small. Let's talk about how small. Your hair, the tip of it, is about 70 microns, which is something we can see with our eyes. Red blood cells that flow throughout our body are about 8 microns, something that we can't see with our eyes. These nanoplastics that we're generating can be smaller than 1 micron in size. This is much smaller than the red blood cells and orders of magnitude smaller than the hair. So you can imagine why it would be so difficult to detect these nanoplastics in aquatic environments. Because of their small size, the fish at the very bottom of the food chain, the smallest of the smallest, can feed on these nanoplastics. Then the fish higher up on the food chain, such as salmon, will eat these smaller fish, and these nanoplastics will start bioaccumulating up throughout the food chain. Then, of course, when we have seafood as part of our diet, these nanoplastics can enter our body. Now, because of their small size, these nanoplastics can also translocate. What this means is that they can move to different parts of your body, such as your kidney, your liver, your liver or even your brain. So, to recap, nanoplastics are extremely dangerous because of their small size, making it difficult to detect in the environment. They bioaccumulate through the food chain, and they can translocate to other parts of the, bo the body, such as the brain. Because of these potential dangers, researchers are focused on detecting nanoplastics in the environment. Because if we can measure them, we can do something about them. This is very similar to what happened when we found out there's heavy metals polluting our environments. 
we figured out protocols and strategies to limit their impact to the environment as well as human health. We need to do the same thing with nanoplastics. So let's go over some of the techniques that are being used to detect these nanoplastics. We're going to look at them based on two metrics. Time, how quickly or slowly can a certain process detect nanoplastics, as well as quality. Now what I mean by quality is three things. Number one, is it sensitive to nanoplastics? Because remember, we said that they're really small and hard to detect. Is the process that we're going to be using reliable? Are the is the procedure going to be reproducible? And lastly, is the process non-destructive? Because we want to make sure that whatever technique that we're using does not destroy the sample so that we can give our findings to the next researcher and um, they can ensure that they can find out what the impacts of these nanoplastics are. So the first method that we're going to be looking at is visual inspection. Now visual inspection basically relies on an observer looking at a sample and identifying where the plastics are. Well, this means that different people are going to identify different parts as plastics. So this method is unreliable as well as slow. What about something that's slightly faster? Pyrolysis GCMS. This instrument burns the sample to analyze the gases to see what's inside. Although a very effective method, this instrument burns the sample, which means it's destroying it. So you can't pass on the sample to a toxicologist to find the impacts. If we keep moving down the scale to something um, like the use of dyes, which are sometimes used to selectively paint the plastics in a sample, so when you look at it through a microscope, you can easily see the plastics. But sometimes these dyes can leach out, contaminating the sample and also misidentifying parts as plastics. If we continue moving down the quality scale, we have Raman spectroscopy, which is an amazing tool as it can differentiate between types of plastics, and it can detect nanoplastics. However, this process is slightly slow, which means it's going to cost a lot of money. One instrument that's in the upper quadrant is FTIR spectroscopy, which a lot like Raman can detect um, and differentiate between types of plastics, but it's not sensitive to nanoplastics. It can only go down to 20 microns. So we need something in the upper right-hand quadrant of this graph. This is where my research comes into play. I'm using enhanced dark field hyperspectral microscopy, which is just a mouthful to say it's a high-tech microscope. What's high-tech about this microscope is that we get two types of information. We get spatial information as well as spectral information. What this means is that for every single pixel that's on this image, we get a spectrum. Now what we think is that this spectrum is much like a fingerprint as in it's unique to every element. So if we can use that spectrum to identify different types of materials. So we need to confirm that the instrument actually does this. So we went and did some preliminary testing. We took plastic and we took hundreds of pixels and looked at their spectrums. Here, we're just showing you three. And what we found is that the shape of this spectrum all falls within this tolerance band. So ideally, if we got another spectrum that looks like this and falls within this tolerance band, then it would be a plastic. But this doesn't tell us if it's a, it's a fingerprint just yet. We need to compare plastic versus other elements. So we looked at plastic versus other pollutants. For example, silver. Silver is a common pollutant that can be found as it's used as an antimicrobial agent. If you look at the two graphs, you're probably going to say, well, those two spectrums look the same. Well, the peak for the plastic lies at 600 nanometers. That's the highest point. If the two spectrums were the same, the peak for the silver would also lie at 600 nanometers. However, the peak has redshifted and it's more closer to 700 nanometers. This means that when we look at that tolerance band, silver violates that tolerance. It doesn't fall within the tolerance limit. So this shows that the two spectrums are different and they're unique for every element. We also compared gold, another common engineered nanoparticle that could be, could be a pollutant in the environment. And again, we looked at the two graphs. We can see that peak, there's one peak for plastic and there's two peaks for gold. This means that when we look at the tolerance band, gold violates it. We did the same thing 
We did the same thing with paint flakes, which is another pollutant, as it can chip off shipping vessels and enter aquatic environments. Plastic has one peak, and again, you can see that plastic, the paint chip has multiple peaks. So you can probably guess that it does not fall in that tolerance band. So far, we've just, so far we have looked at um, plastic versus other pollutants. And we wanted to take this instrument one step further. Can it differentiate between types of plastics? So we compared polystyrene on the right and PTFE on the left. And we can see that, unfortunately, the instrument can't differentiate between them because the peaks both lie at 600 nanometers. So the, both the spectrums fall within that tolerance. Although this instrument can't differentiate between the two plastics, what it can do is look for the spectrum, and it will highlight exactly where the plastic lies, which is shown by all the red dots. But so far, we've been testing clean conditions. We've just been ensuring that the instrument does what it says it does. We need to get closer to what happens in the environment. So we know in the environment, there's different size of nanoplastics. There's different surface groups or functional groups that could be on the nanoplastics, as well as various contaminants. So we, po we proposed three research questions and went out and tested for them. We first tested different sized nanoplastics. 10 micron, 1 micron, and 0.1 micron. And we wanted to see, does the spectrum change as size changes? And we found that all the spectrums, again, fall within that tolerance. This answered our first research question, that size does not change the spectrum. Next, we looked at surface groups. We want to see if attachments or functionalized groups will change the spectrum. We tested our control group, which is the 10 micron polystyrene microbeads, with 20 micron uh, polystyrene beads, which are functionalized. And we can see that, again, when we compare the two spectrums, they fall within this tolerance. So this, again, tells us that surface groups does not change the spectrum. The last one is contaminants. This one's especially important, because in the aquatic environment, you're not just going to get water. There's going to be different contaminants. So the first one we tested for is algae, which we think is a common contaminant that will be found in the water. And when we compare the two spectrums, we can see that the plastic mixed with algae and just the control group does not change the spectrum. It falls within the tolerance, which is good. So, so far we know what the spectrum of the plastic looks like. What about the spectrum for the algae? Well, we already confirmed that different elements have different um, spectrums, and we see that exactly for algae. What this allowed us to do, because the algae spectrum is different than plastic, we can ask the software to selectively only look for the spectrum of plastic. So that if we have a sample like this, we can identify exactly where the plastic is automatically. We repeated the same process with soil. We compared the spectrum, and we wanted to ensure that it falls within that tolerance. We knew what the spectrum for plastic looks like. We wanted to see what soil looks like, and we saw that soil has multiple peaks, and that allowed us to identify where the plastic is. So far, all three research questions were answered. But there's something else that we need to do to get a little closer to environmental conditions. That's the effect of time. Because remember, we said that the plastic bottle that we threw out gets exposed to the sun as well as temperature changes. So that happens over a period of 10, 15, or 20 years. So what we did is we tried to mimic what happens over that long period of time in the environment in our lab in the span of 45 days. So we took different sized nanoplastics and exposed it to UV light as well as temperature changes. And we're just taking out these plastics and we want to see if the spectrum changes with the effect of time. Because if the spectrum doesn't change, what we'll be able to do is we'll one step closer to taking an environmental sample, say from the St. Lawrence River, bringing it to the lab and seeing if it has nanoplastics based on that one spectrum that we've identified. At the beginning of the presentation, I showed you this image of nanoplastics that could be in seafood. Now, those of you in the audience who are vegetarian or don't eat seafood were probably very relieved. But I'm here to tell you that it's also in the salt that we eat, that you use for seasoning. It's in the tea that you drink in the morning. It's also in rice, 
beer, and the tap water that we drink every day. After showing you this, you're probably going to ask me a few questions like, how much nanoplastic is in the environment? How much nanoplastic are we consuming? And at what concentration are these nanoplastics harmful to us? The scary thing is I don't have the answers to these questions because we don't have an established method to detect these nanoplastics in the environment. But that's what the goal of my research is, to take these findings and pass it to the toxicologist or the marine biologist or a water safety technician officer so that they can answer these questions for you. My research is one step in this process of identifying what the impact of nanoplastics is on the environment and our health. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arav, and also for uh, handling uh, Microsoft's interruptions that uh, happen to all of us uh, in some presentation uh, uh, or, or teaching a class uh, at one time or another. Uh, well, I've, now I'd like to invite all three of our change makers up to the stage, and we'll take some questions from the audience. Um, we have a volunteer with a microphone, I believe. Yes, oh, Monica is there, our volunteer, Monica. Uh, and uh, so if you have a question, please just raise your hand, um, and Monica will come over with a microphone so that we can all hear the question. Um, and just please indicate who you're asking the question to. Um, good evening. Uh, my question is to Hamid Reza. Uh, fantastic presentation, by the way. Uh, so my question is regarding uh, how you said that you would pack more stones to get more dense, uh, you know, system, right? Mm -hmm. So my question is this: what, Would it be more efficient to use something like interlocking uh, rock blocks, or would it be more efficient to use a lot of fine? Uh, uh, you know, rocks, like which would be more efficient in terms of like air gaps and whatnot. That, thank you. Well, so the thing is, uh, the more packed the pack, the pack that is, the, the better the heat exchange between the air and the rocks. So both the charging and discharging time would be less, which is a good thing for us, right? And also, in our case, because we are like we want to produce electricity from this system, that means that we can get higher output because of the better exchange of the heat between the air and the rocks. However, there is also a trade-off that this can increase the pressure drop that our system experiences, right? Because like, there is more packed, so we need a, a larger fat. So actually, that's one of the research objectives that we are trying to answer. And uh, for that, we, all, we, of course, need a solid numerical framework, and that's what we are actually after. So I, I, I can answer that after that, <laughs> in like numerical framework. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the question. Good evening. Thank you for the great presentation, Fatima. This is a question on, uh, so you said blueberries can be used. If I use frozen blueberries or fresh blueberries, is that going to make a difference? Would polyphenols denature if uh, I freeze the blueberries? No, no it would not. Polyphenols have not found to be degraded because of temperature differences so far. So yes, you're good even if you use frozen blueberries. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Good news for all the smoothie league drinkers out there. Hi, um, I have a question for Amit Reza. Uh, you were presenting that potentially that would take more than seven hours to um, warm up the bed, um, but how does that compare to the actual time scale you need for feeding a gas turbines, which is generally used in some kind of relief conditions? An hour is enough to, to run a gas turbine for quite some time. Well, depending on the energy demand that we have, uh, we can scale the system. So, for instance, uh, for a system that is, like imagine a packed bed of rock that is two by four by two, like a cube that is packed with rocks, that would actually be enough for us in terms of like the seven hours of charging would be enough for us, but also it, con it, like, it, it, like, it is contingent on the temperature of the air that we're sending. So there are many elements into, the, into play, but for uh, like several kilowatt, kilowatt hour of storage, Something like seven hours would be completely uh, like enough for us to uh, have our energy system uh, operate. I have a second question, uh, this time for Arav. Um, you, your research is based on a known library of the different pollutants 
you would encounter in your sample. Um, so what happens if you don't know what you're finding? Do you have to use a more destructive method to find what's in the sample? So there's two options. You can, you can use, um, you can basically do two things. You can either create your own library um, with different common pollutants that you think you can, uh, that you would know of. So create a library of the various different plastics and then just only look for that plastic spectrum or use an already built library, like an open source library so that would allow you to do that. Another option is yes, you can use like a destructive method to like um, basically clear the sample of any organic matter, but you would try to avoid that because the whole point is to see that like where the nanoplastics in a sample lies. And if you're going to clear it, then you're not going to be able to find that information. Hi, um, thanks for the, oh gosh, my hair is getting stuck. <laughs> thanks for the great talks. Um, I have two questions. The first one's for Arav. Um, so it sounds like I don't want nanoplastics in my brain, but my question is, what does it actually do once it's there? That's a really good question. And again, there's no studies that, at least from what I know of, of like, of what it does to us. And that's primarily due to factors that we don't have methods to detect them. Like if you tell me like what concentrations or if they're actually in your brain, we don't know. We just think that they do based on the properties of how small they are. Um, but hopefully in a couple of years, we'd be able to answer that question. And after establishing a way to do it, we can tell you like if it's actually harmful or if it's okay. 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 Thank you. Um, and my next question was for Fatima. Um, I can't remember what the correct word was for it, but a substance that helps raise the good bacteria and lower the bad pathogens. How does that substance, like from my understanding, there are tons of both of those kinds of things. How, how does it differentiate between good and bad for us? Um, yeah. That's a very good question. So the compound that we're talking about here is anthocyanin. So anthocyanin belongs to those compounds. Uh, so, so a name, uh, let me take you to another name which you are, all might be familiar of, the prebiotics and probiotics, because that's all they're out in the market. So prebiotics are compounds which are kind of acting as a food for the gut microbes. So they feed on them and they increase in number. And anthocyanin is such a prebiotic compound, which has been researched so far. But in addition to its prebiotic properties, studies are also showing that it is having an antimicrobial effect against the pathogens. We do not know about the exact pathway in which they are doing it, but several in vitro studies and even studies which has been done in mice, is an, also in in vitro studies such as the gut stimulator reactors, uh, similar other reactors which has been developed by other research labs are also showing that they are having an antimicrobial effect against the pathogens. So it's a prebiotic effect by increasing the growth of uh, the beneficial microbes in terms of how these microbes are ultimately affecting our different uh, health components. So there are both the studies, so we are trying to see if they have, they are, since they are said to have both the effects, how can they play a role in antimicrobial resistance? I'll definitely be reading more about that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for their great talks. I will have a question for Arav. Um, so I was wondering, what is the resolution limit of your apparatus? And like, I know in your, the case of your project, you were really interested in nanoparticles plastics, but I was wondering if it could be applied to biology, for example, for like identifying cell types based on the expression of like different um, molecules, like such a, for me, I'm more interested in the brain. Yep. So like based on the expression of different neurotransmitters, so like, could you develop a bit on this, please? Sure. So the resolution, if I'm not mistaken, like the theoretical resolution is two nanometers, if I'm not mistaken. And if I'm also not mistaken, this instrument originally is used in like the healthcare and medicinal fields. So I think originally it is used for cells and stuff like that. Um, I don't know to what extent, but I know that's what it was originally used for. So the resolution is a bit less, not well, it's much more like bigger than the um, resolution of light. So you could identify like vesicles with this, I believe like that or like a few hundred nanometers. I think the, am I, am I, am I wrong here? Like, um, because I think the resolution of light is like about 200 nanometer. Sorry, can you repeat the question? So the resolution of your apparatus is less than the resolution of light, right? 
Yes. So um, it uses scattering, scattered light, so it's not directly at the sample. And I think that's what's owed to the lower um, resolution. Thank you. Thank you so much. Other questions? Dominic. Hi, uh, thank you for the great presentations. They're very engaging. I have a question for Hamid Reza about the energy storage. Um, what are the drawbacks of thermal storage with rocks? Like if I'm developing a project, why would I not want to use it? Is it like the round trip efficiency um, or, yeah? That's a great question. Well, first of all, uh, like I said, if you want, if thermal energy storage is to be used for electricity generation purposes, we have to deal with high temperatures. And some rocks can do either physical or chemical degradation or some like unknown uh, interaction that uh, we might not know like initially. Uh, that's one thing that you have to like uh, anybody that wants to design this system should be like worried about and look into. Other than that, like I cannot think of anything else. That's the only thing that we are basically right now we are um, real like that is something that we are we have taken into account. Um, yeah, that's basically uh, the, the one thing. But in terms of uh, the sustainability, th this can offer a really good uh, alternative for lithium ion okay, Thank you. Yeah, sure. So thank you for the three presentation. I would have a question for the number two about battery storage. Uh, well, did you study the impact of the fluid that go through the rocks? Because like usually, Let's say, I think to me, it's very similar to geothermal system, which use like water, though steam water. So if it's an impact, which depending if it's air, steam, or water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So what we have considered so far is only air being gas. But for fluid, since they can be either gas and liquid, right? So for the gas part, we have already taken air, and we plan to study carbon dioxide as well. But for the liquid, we haven't done any simulation for that. But of course, like the fluid flow needs to be uh, predicted in, ter you know, like in advance to, pre uh, like to in, in advance to studying the heat transfer, because it's like a, uh, because there are coupled, like everything there is coupled. And when you want to uh, when you want to study the heat transfer of a system, the first thing you have to do is to study the fluid flow, right? So that's a that's a necessity, and that's also that's already taken into account in, my, in in our study. But for the liquid, we haven't done uh, we haven't gone into that part, and also because these packed bed of rocks are already really packed, sending liquid would be extremely difficult, which needs that we need larger fans, and it will probably decrease the efficiency of overall efficiency of the system. So for now, we're interested in just sending gas and see uh, like how it does in terms of like, overall performance of our energy storage. All right, thank you. And second question, do you think it can be a good um, arrangement if you take solar thermal with your system instead of PV because you can straightly have high temperature? Yeah, actually, it was already on the slide, but, it, but because it would be too much to just include that, and that's actually a good, good, really good point. So uh, we can either use the, produ uh, the electricity produced from solar panels or wind turbines, or we can use uh, a, a technology called concentrated solar power, which you're referring to, I, I believe, which basically directs the solar uh, light by mirrors into the, uh, like into the object, in, in here being the rocks. So that's something that can be done, and that's actually a, to a topic of uh, like last year's set talk that Valerie had. She used uh, on the same stage. She used. She talked about molten salt and how it can be directly heated by use of concentrated solar panels, solar power, which is basically directly heating that. But uh, since it's, it's like we are more interested in uh, doing active, basically active thermal energy storage, and that requires us to. Uh, use electric heater and fan and the electricity produced from solar panels and wind turbines compared to CSP method. But that's also actually an, an option and I haven't seen any research going on that. So like if you're interested, you should, uh, like there is a literature gap for that, so go for it. Thank you. Abram and uh, Dominic, I got a question as well. 
Uh, thank you. Question for Hamid Reza. Um, a lot of our energy is, of course, used by transportation systems. And other than the Flintstones, we have not seen rock-powered cars. But have you thought of like what the energy to weight ratios that might be achievable are? And does that at all compare to anything that we would be able to use for our transportation? Yeah, I Thank guess we, uh, like, um, so the, the whole efficiency of the system can be defined by a parameter called energy density. So different rocks offer different energy densities. And based on the application that we want, well, we can definitely go for higher energy density materials. But, it is, but another important factor that we have to consider is the temperature that we can provide for this system. So if we know the temperature that we can provide, the higher it is, like the more energy we can produce, and also the higher the energy density of the material, again, we can have uh, like, um, a more efficient system. So it really comes down to how much energy is required for the application, as well as how long this system is required to work. So if you have those questions with the right numerical framework, we can simulate them and, 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 and like answer uh, your question. So it basically comes to, down to uh, the energy density of the material, uh, as well as the temperature that we can provide for the system. Uh, and, and we can know if it will be applicable to uh, whatever energy demand we have. Yeah, sure. Dominic, I think. Thank you so much. Um, question for Fatima on the blueberries, I guess. <laughs> My mother would be happy to know that um, yeah, she left her frozen blueberries. So I guess my question is, how much of that compound do you need to eat to make a difference? Like, do I need to eat pounds and pounds of blueberries? Or will they eventually like concentrate that compound in some sort of pills? Or that would have higher concentration that would actually have, have it make a difference? Or how, mu how much is needed there to actually have an, a real effect? That is a very interesting question. In fact, uh, research has been done based on uh, different amounts of blueberry concentrates and trying to give them on participants to see how their effect is being done. Uh, the amount is important as well as how long you consume something is also important. Because if I say, for example, I have a lot of blueberries today and I don't have it the next few days, then the effect might not stay as long as we might want it to be. So even if, so if I'm right, the current uh, amounts that are being tested uh, ranges in between 100 to 200 grams of blueberries. But again, it might depend on the type of blueberries because, for example, wild type blueberries has got higher anthocyanin contents than the low bush blueberries, for example. Different varieties, it might differ. And the studies usually are conducted for at least 8 to 11 weeks. So a long-term conception is also important because as we eat them, yes, they do affect our microbes. But like I said, if I do not have it tomorrow or maybe I skip for an entire week, it is possible that our gut microbiota by, might revert back to where it came from. So dose is important, as well as consuming them for a regular team is important as well. So the gut emulator is going to tell us. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. The, the question is also for uh, uh, Amin Reza. So uh, if, if I'm not wrong, one of the parameter to define efficiency of storage systems is, is a cycle efficiency, how much energy you can get back out of, uh, uh, out of the energy that, that you put in. Um, did, you, did you do any simulations around, uh, around this parameter and how would that hopefully compare to, to other systems that we're yeah. using today? Mm -hmm. Well, so, uh, so we have two efficiencies here. First is the efficiency of converting uh, renewable energy and turn it into heat. And for that, electric heaters offer like 100% efficiency. They're almost 100%. So that's basically not of our concern. But what we are concerned with is the efficiency of turning heat into electricity. Currently, I'm only focusing on the pack bed of rocks for now to, see, to uh, predict the heat transport there and see what happens, and then see what happens with the gas turbine efficiency. That's something that I haven't done. But in our research lab, uh, so a lab member, Nick, is uh, currently working on the round trip efficiency of the whole system. And I think uh, the figure that he came to was around 50 or 60 percent. So yeah, she just gave the thumbs up. So it's 50 to 60 percent. What, what is the right number? 60 percent. 60 percent round trip efficiency. Yeah, so that's good. And 
does that compare to how does that compare to a, a battery that we're using today? Uh, yeah, so for the batteries, I think the efficiencies are much higher. But again, there is a matter of uh, how sustainable we want to be. So, um, like, um, if we have an, a system which is not really efficient, but it's dirt cheap and also is sustainable, we have to go for it. Like, although batteries offer a much more efficient solution to our energy transition and our like intermittency of the renewables, but they are like they, there are concerns about their sustainability. No matter how how efficient they are. I think we should actually at least consider other options that have lower efficiencies but offer a much more sustainable solution. But uh, that's a true point. Th our thermal energy storage cannot compete, at least for now, with uh, how efficient batteries are, but it is for sure that they are much more sustainable. So I think we'll take two more questions here and then there. Hi, um, I, uh, I'm, uh, I'm an old mining engineer. It's my first time at SED Talk. I'm really impressed. But I've seen so many things happen in the world. They always come back. For instance, I, I will give you an, ex an example. I, I worked in uranium mines. I worked in asbestos mines. I worked in gold mines. Always the lungs, the lungs, the lungs. And it, it, it killed it. Uh, but they had no business uh, stopping your, uh, uranium uh, in Quebec. They closed them down right away well, because of, of, of a thing called hydroelectric power. Now, maybe I'm getting too practical here and not much science. But I remember silicosis. I remember uh, asbestosis. And I'm, I'm, they're all exaggerated. If you took care of yourself and the people, they would not be a problem. Now, I'm, because you're a mining engineer, I thought you could reflect, or maybe you don't have to, but that's my feeling. Anyways, now I have all this new science and mic microscopic uh, 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 you know, uh, stuff. Uh, it's fine, but it, it, it's, it, you're talking about different parts of your body. All I ever talked of for, I've been mining for 50 years. All we ever talked about was your lungs and everything else goes from that. Can you comment, how come, how come nothing goes in the lungs anymore? Um, like, yeah, that, 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 uh, they were all good points. Um, but yeah, like. There's no air pollution in the I think the last question will take us here. Uh, thank you all for the great presentations. Uh, my question is actually for Hamid Reza. Um, so you mentioned that the rocks will be heated, but um, are they going to be stored under high pressures? And also, along with that, are you aware of any safety issues right now at the stage of your project? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, so as for temperature, yes, we are. We intend to store. I mean, the whole energy storage works on how long we can keep this energy, uh, this packed bed of rock, at high temperatures. So ideally, what we'd like to have is a well, very well insulated packed bed of rocks that would not experience much heat loss. So the question, uh, the answer to your first question is that yes, we plan to keep it as high as possible because uh, we can only make use of hot air. So if it loses its heat, basically it's losing its energy, and it is of no good use. It's, we cannot produce electricity with cold air, right? It, it, is not, it has not the energy enough to rotate the gas turbine blades. So yeah, we have to keep it as hot as possible. And um, to your second question, what was it? Um, before I get to that, I, I don't know if I mentioned Safety it wrong. Issues? I meant Yes, but I actually meant high pressure, it's not high temperature. Uh, yeah, so uh, like, yeah, for, for, uh, like if we can, so there are different scenarios for that. For, uh, if we can, in, uh, we can keep it in higher pressure, like pressure, uh, pressured vessels, that, be, uh, that we, in that case, we can produce much more electricity, but there are safety issues with that. They cost much like more. So for our purpose, we're, we're, we haven't still got into the part of uh, including uh, those effects, but currently there are different designs for that. There are like they they they, they are based on either low or high pressure vessels. So uh, it's something that like in theory that will help us in producing more electricity. So yeah, like higher temperature, higher pressure, 
good to go. Uh, I guess Torben would love it. Thank you. Yeah. And for safety issues, like I said, um, the, for instance, like there, there are commercially available uh, like energy storage systems. Like I haven't considered them yet because, like I said, I'm more interested in numerical, in first establishing a solid numerical framework. So I haven't gone to the part to include how uh, like higher temperatures can cause chemical degradation or physical ones. But I know, for instance, in Finland, uh, a company called Polar Night, Polar Night, if I'm not mistaken, they have uh, taken sands up to a temperature of 1,000 degrees Celsius. And like, the, the results were surprisingly well. They didn't run into any uh, safety issues. And there are, there are currently, uh, I think, 80,000 homes are being run only on, uh, this, uh, on, like they only rely on the energy produced from this uh, sand thermal energy storage. But yeah, of course, there are safety issues at high temperature, so uh, we, we should do, like, uh, when we get to that, we should consider them. Great, well, I'd like to thank all of you for your excellent questions, and uh, I'd like to take this chance to thank all three of our change makers again. And really, I'd like to also thank them, you know, f not only for their talks tonight, but really for the efforts over the past five months. Um, it's been a long journey with, uh, with each of them, um, and uh, we wish you all the success uh, as you complete your projects. Um, on behalf of the changemakers, I'd also like to thank their supervisors, um, who've given them uh, tremendous support throughout their projects, but as well as in their uh, involvement within the Talks program. I'd like to thank WSP and uh, Mr. Eric Purcell for, um, for their support of, uh, of said talks as well as Eric's time um, to talk to us tonight. On behalf of the uh, changemakers, I'd also like to thank the members of the um, said talks uh, selection committee, um, the alumni changemakers, our faculty and industry partners, and all of those who have given their time and feedback to the students as they develop their talks over the past several months. Uh, specifically, we'd like to thank the skill set staff um, at Teaching and Learning Services here at McGill, and we have to acknowledge uh, Andy Churchill for his extensive efforts in working with, uh, with this team. So I think you can give uh, Andy a hand. <laughs> of course, we also have to thank the, uh, the team at Tized, so Monica, uh, Parissa, and Irene for all of their work in organizing the event, as well as uh, efforts throughout the semester. And finally, our, uh, our change makers tonight presented a small selection, a little snapshot of the great research that's being done across the Faculty of Engineering. I hope that students um, in the audience are inspired to try to think about how they can present uh, their research uh, to our community um, in future uh, events and to take part in this program in the future. Um, lastly, I'd like to uh, mention our new We are proud to announce that there is a new master's program in sustainability and engineering and design being launched by TIZED um, in fall 2024. So if you are interested in our new uh, master's program in sustainability and engineering and design, please see myself, Monica, Parissa Irene, uh, or Professor Goshal, who's here as well. Sebastian is here. Uh, and uh, we'd be happy to talk to you about it. And I believe you can also take a scan of the QR code uh, at the entrance, Monica. Excellent. So now I'd like to, uh, to thank you all for, for joining us, and uh, we'll now uh, recess to the uh, next room where we can have a cocktail reception. Thank you very much.